Hello everyone, Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense. Thank you for watching. I have another Monday quarterback video for you. I'm going to play this video and talk about things that are going on to better explain what's going on and talk about things that I think that are being done right and or done wrong. Here we go. Hello everyone. I'm Stephen Greenlee, Public Information Officer for the Reno Police Department. This critical incident community briefing is intended to inform you of an incident that occurred in the city of Reno involving officers with the Reno Police Department. You're about to see relevant video footage and learn about other evidence and police procedures related to this case, so you have a better understanding of the events of that day based on what we know right now. This video is not intended to draw any conclusions on whether or not the involved officers acted consistently with our policies or the law. These conclusions will come after all facts are known and the investigation is complete. A word of caution, the images and information you're about to see may be disturbing. When a police officer uses force to arrest a suspect or to defend themselves or others, it can be graphic and difficult to watch. In addition, there may be strong language used by those in this video. Viewer discretion is advised, especially for young children and sensitive viewers. Uniformed Reno police officers who have regular contact with the public are equipped with body-worn cameras which are generally affixed to the front of the officer's uniform. The camera captures video 30 seconds before the officers actually activate the camera but they do not capture any audio. This feature is designed to record incidents when an officer does not have the time to activate the camera. My name is Oliver Miller and I'm a Deputy Chief with the Reno Police Department. Anytime an officer is involved in a shooting, it's our policy to have the incident investigated by an outside agency in accordance with the Washoe County Officer Involved Shooting Protocol. These investigations are complete and thorough. They typically include interviews of those involved, collection and review of any available recordings, and an examination of all the evidence. The investigating agency will evaluate the facts and evidence and submit the case in its entirety to the Washoe County District Attorney's Office for criminal review. The District Attorney's Office evaluates the case and determines whether or not any criminal charges are appropriate. After their review, the Washoe County District Attorney's Office provides a public report with their findings. The video provided in the briefing was captured on the body-worn cameras of the involved officers. It's important to note that body-worn cameras only provide a limited view and cannot capture everything an officer sees or experiences. On December 4th, 2022, at approximately 6.07 a.m., Reno police officers were dispatched to the area of North Virginia Street and 5th Street to check the welfare of an individual who was reportedly standing in the roadway and possibly in possession of a knife. The initial responding officer contacted the suspect and tried to speak with him before ordering him out of the roadway. The suspect refused to follow officers' commands and continued to walk northbound on Virginia Street in the roadway while carrying a sheathed knife in his hand. Hello, sir. Hello there. Oh, yeah, at he's walking away from me northbound on Virginia uh, from 5th. Hey man, can you get out of the road, please? I'm 
give me the channel. Looks like he might have a sheath in his hand. WMA black jacket, blue undershirt. Okay, so <clears throat> what he's asking for is for everyone else on that channel to basically shut the fuck up. Um, he is about to get out and deal with a person who is armed, and that is a very high risk type of scenario, and he does not want a bunch of unnecessary radio traffic going on on that channel when he might need to very suddenly and unexpectedly have to key up his radio to request help, to advise that he's running at him with a knife or shots fired, whatever. Because if there's a bunch of other people talking on the radio during this time dispatch is sending someone out to a theft call sending someone out to a loud party call someone's doing a traffic stop at such and such place someone is at a um, rundown motel uh, wanting to run tags on vehicles all that will eat up the airtime and if something critical is going on for this officer and he tries to go key up his radio to talk he may not be able to get out so depending on the radio system, if he presses that button while someone else is talking, it may just make a tone noise. It'll go and he won't get out. No one will hear him. Uh, even if he is able to key the radio and it'll start bleed, bleeding through while someone else is still talking, it's going to be garbled sounding. No one's going to know what's uh, being said or anything like that. So this is a pretty common practice when officers get somewhere and they're about to get out and it seems like it's going to be a more high risk type of scenario. They'll call for the uh, channel to be held that way uh, only them and whoever else is on that scene will be talking on that radio and it's a clear line of communication to dispatch without any other bullshit shenanigans going on everyone else will switch their radio to the secondary channel so when it comes to public safety agencies especially law enforcement they're going to have more than one channel for a radio system to be able to talk to. At bare minimum, an agency should have three channels to be able to operate off of. There are some agencies out there that probably have 20 different channels that they could operate off of. Um, you know, back in the day when it was just all old uh, analog systems and, you know, each frequency uh, would need to be allocated for a channel. It could be a little bit difficult for some agencies to have that many channels unless they're a very large agency. Nowadays, everything's pretty much digital. You got talk groups. You can literally have on a system um, for one agency, they could have 30 different talk groups if they wanted to. Um, they could have an endless number of, well, I wouldn't say an endless number, but they could have a very high number of talk groups uh, for an agency. And some agencies could have their main dispatch channel. They have that channel two that you know everyone knows to go to in the event whatever goes on. Channel three could be like a talk around. So like you can, if you had a long conversation, you can go down to channel three and have that long conversation. Um, the investigations people may have their own channel. They may have a couple channels to be able to operate off of. Um, animal control may have their own channel to operate off of. Um, there may be a channel. Uh, for just um, um, like traffic and uh, not traffic enforcement, um, like uh, the like people call them meter maids. Um, I don't forgot what the hell they're called. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the people who go out checking parking meters and stuff like that, if they're part of that police agency, they may have a channel to to operate off of. Uh, they may have. Uh, special events channel so like if there's like parades and stuff everyone knows to go to this parade channel uh, so that they're not tying up the main dispatch channel the SWAT team could have their own channel they could have a couple channels on there so uh, there's multiple channels that these uh, radios would have but anyway that's that's kind of going a little too far off what I was talking about all right getting back into it yeah, he's walking on the middle of the roadway he's going back to the sidewalk now 
So he had attempted just to make contact with the guy and ask him to please get out of the roadway. And I would imagine that once he got out of the roadway, maybe he would just continue on and go on about his business. Um, there's nothing illegal about someone walking around with a sheathed knife. Hell, there's nothing illegal about a person walking around with a knife that doesn't have a sheath on it. There's nothing illegal about a person walking around with a gun on their hip or a rifle slung across their back. It is peculiar to some people, and in some environments, it will draw questions like, why is this person walking around with a rifle? That's not a common sight. It's legal, but it's not common. And so that makes people curious. People walking around with a knife in their hand. There's nothing against it, but it's not normal. Like, how many times do you go out in public and you see people walking around with a fucking knife in their hand? Hello, sir, can you stop, please? Right, Charles, it looks like he might be on the knife with his left hand. Uh, for 43, he's going to have pretty heavy clothing on. So why would he be mentioning that he has heavy clothing? Because that's going to be important to know for the deployment of a taser device. The probes that get fired out of a taser, the darts are only so long. They can't be too long because if they penetrate a person who has thin clothing or no clothing at all, then it could penetrate too deep and cause some type of injury internally. The tasers are supposed to be less than lethal. So if the darts are too long to stab into someone, it could potentially become a lethal weapon. So they're short enough to be able to pierce people's skin and they have little barbs on the end so that once they go through the skin and go into the tissue, it's like a fish hook. It, it'll stick in there. Heavy clothing, there you fire into someone with a thick jacket, that dart will never touch their skin or get close enough to their skin to allow that arc to jump through. So people who have heavy clothing on, the taser is pretty much ineffective on them because the probes will never get close enough to the skin or be able to touch the skin to allow the current to go through. The thicker clothing uh, could also uh, have an effect on impact munitions. I already got the feeling that once I've released this video, I'm going to get a copyright claim because of the music playing in the background. I got that once on another video. Um, I can't remember which video it was, but I had a notification pop up in my, my box saying that there was a copyright claim. Um, and it listed, you know, who owned the rights to the music or whatever, which I appealed it. And uh, I won the appeal. Because I was obviously not trying to play this person's music <laughs> all along. But um, that's kind of on the back side of things with this channel. That's kind of the like bullshit I got to deal with. is little stupid stuff like that. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, there have in the past, I don't know if it's kind of a current thing anymore. But in the past, when all these automatic um, uh, algorithms were detecting you know, copyrighted music and blocking it. Like Facebook, if you start a live stream and there's uh, music playing in the background, you try to upload a video and there's, you know, copyrighted music playing in the background, it'll mute that whole video. Like, you won't hear a damn thing. So what some officers and some agencies were doing back in the day when people would come up and start recording them with their cell phones, the officers would take their phone out and start playing copyrighted music. That way, that person who was recording them they ever uploaded it or if they were doing a live stream it would automatically get muted
continuing to walk northbound in the travel lanes. Are they continuing walking northbound in the travel lanes? At this point, well, he already hit the, okay, so he hit the siren. Um, I was about to say, I think it would be uh, in his best interest to hit that siren and use the PA. So I think this is what we're about to see. This is the Reno Police. Put down whatever you have in your hand, please. Just want to make sure you're okay, man. Reno Police. The officer followed the suspect in his car with his emergency lights on to initiate a detention and to alert passing motorists of the roadway hazard. The officer ordered the suspect to get on the sidewalk and drop the knife, but he continued walking away and refused all verbal commands. More officers arrived and they followed the suspect as he turned onto 6th Street, then to Sierra Street, and finally to 5th Street, where the suspect began to run. Officers chased the suspect on foot. When the suspect ran into the valet area of a downtown casino, the suspect stopped and turned towards officers and took a fighting stance with the knife in his hand. An officer deployed a taser at the suspect two times and both deployments were ineffective. The suspect continued to run while maintaining possession of the knife. The suspect managed to reach the glass entry doors of the casino and attempted to enter. An officer shot at the suspect, striking him several times with a service weapon. The officer involved in the shooting later told investigators that he could see people on the other side of the glass doors and feared that the suspect posed a threat to their safety. Drop the knife, dude. Come on. So at this point, uh, let's talk about uh, use of force options. So initially, you know, the guy walking in the uh, roadway, yes, that's a traffic hazard. Um, the officer, I think, attempted just to try and correct the issue, tell the guy to get out of the road and get on the sidewalk, and probably probably was going to leave it at that. As soon as dude got back on the sidewalk, he was going to leave, go back in service. Um, and there's nothing illegal about walking around with a knife, right? But, it is peculiar. This whole interaction where he's following behind him, trying to get his attention, tell him to get out of the way, activate the, the emergency lights, got on the PA. Like, if the dude was deaf, maybe he, did, he couldn't hear the officer. Well, all the flashy lights being turned on, that should have got his attention. And he should have stopped and looked at him and been like, you know, oh my God, what's, why is this cop car behind me with the lights on? Um, so obviously there's something more going on with this guy, right? He is intentionally being defiant and he is armed with a knife. So now that makes the situation more higher risk because once you get out on foot and try to get up to that person, they could become a potential threat. So because this is now a more high risk type of situation, I believe that these officers or some of these officers should be getting long guns out, getting either a shotgun or a rifle out to be able to provide the appropriate lethal coverage to a person who has a lethal weapon. That way, if he becomes a lethal threat, those appropriate tools will be the best tools to stop the threat. Long guns and or long guns, shotguns and rifles uh, are far superior to pistols. They have uh, more accuracy and better incapacitating power. So, with the accuracy, there's reduced chances of missed rounds, uh, reduced chances of collateral damage. There is um, a better chance that because they have better incapacitating power that it will take fewer rounds and that it will stop that person far enough away to where they can't get close enough to harm the officers. A pistol, because it has a very short barrel and you only have your two hands to hold on to it to help make it as accurate as you can, when you go to pull the trigger, that littlest amount of movement can move the overall gun enough to where your shot placement is way off. 
Now, the further the target is, that means that you are off by several inches to a foot or more. The, the pistol rounds are not very powerful. They can incapacitate, but they're not very powerful, and it oftentimes takes multiple rounds to do that. So, in theory, a person uh, could charge at an officer, get shot multiple times with the pistol, and then be able to reach that officer before they are incapacitated. Whereas with a rifle or shotgun, if they charge at the officer, then once that lethal force is delivered to them, there's a higher chance of them immediately stopping and no longer being a threat after that and would be some distance away from that officer, significantly reducing any chances of that officer being injured. So I don't know if we're going to see rifles out or not, but we should be seeing rifles out. Uh, he did mention the heavy clothing. So tasers at this point, everyone should know they're going to be pretty much ineffective. So if they have a large uh, OC can, like the MK9 with a big stream on it, it's more, uh, more of a riot can, but it has a pretty good reach on it. If they have something like that, they should be getting that out. If they have a pepper ball gun, they should probably consider getting that out. If the jacket is so thick and heavy enough, the impact um, benefit from it probably may not have that much of a benefit to it because he's basically going to be wearing padded clothing and he's not going to feel the full brunt of those rounds hitting him. But once they burst, when they hit him, the pepper spray powder, OC powder, will float around in his, his facial area and he'll breathe that in, get in his eyes, and he'll... Um, succumb to the effects of that. An impact weapon like a 40 millimeter launcher or um, a 12 gauge beanbag. The 12 gauge beanbag, even with people who are wearing minimal minimal clothing, uh, doesn't always seem to have that great of an effect on people. 40 millimeter as well. Um, and if he's got thicker clothing on, it's going to be extra padding for him. So there... Um, Usefulness is probably not going to be very high. Uh, a pepper ball gun or a large pepper spray uh, delivery device or even just a your personal uh, pepper spray device are probably going to be the more um, useful, less lethal weapons to utilize at this point. Uh, there is another device that could uh, have been of or could ha be of, of benefit it's a, a device called the bowler wrap. So as he's walking uh, away from them, they get out on foot. It's a device that they could fire at his legs. And um, it's a bowler wrap. So the, the wires will go forward and then wrap all the way around his legs, causing him to most likely trip, fall, and hit the ground. Now at that point, is he still able to fight and stuff? Yes. But you will have hindered their mobility uh, for a little bit until they can uh, shake that loose. While they're immobilized to some extent on the ground and it's harder for them to maneuver, that's when you can get closer and then just paint their face with some pepper spray and then back off and let them deal with that and see if you can get compliance before you try to go up there and touch them and go hands-on and they're swinging a knife. Uh, the bowler wrap is a newer device. There's not that many places out there to have it. Um, and part of that reason is, is cost. I think... Last time I looked for the prices on those things, they're all they're about almost like a thousand dollars. So there's a lot of agencies out there. They have uh, very tight budgets, and, it's, and there's some departments out there who've been defunded. So whatever tight budget they had to begin with is now extremely tight, and they don't have much money to play with at all. And then um, anytime there's something brand new come out, and you get old heads in charge. Um, they could be somewhat slow to embrace some newer technology. Like even when tasers were coming out, you know, there were some people who were like, well, I don't know about that thing. Uh, uh, unfortunately, that's sometimes what you got to deal with when there's people in charge. And another thing with uh, a problem with people who are in charge, the people under them often do not question them. Because that's seen as 
insubordination or that scene is someone having a, a character flaw. Why are you going to be questioning your chief? Why are you going to be questioning your, your captain, your major? So if someone brings up, hey, hey chief, how about this bowler wrap? And the chief's like, oh, that thing's a gimmick. It ain't going to work. Well, if people start questioning that and, and continue to press on, well, some people have an ego. And they're going to take offense to that. Well, you, you fucking questioning me, boy? So that's why some agencies don't adopt uh, newer technologies or newer things is some of the people in charge. And so that basically creates an echo chamber. So when there's an echo chamber and no one listens to any new ideas and it's all the same bullshit, nothing progresses. Nothing gets done. And that's usually... Um, those places are usually um, where you will hear the phrase, well, that's always how it's been done. That's always how we, that's, that's how we've always done it. <laughs> I got some rage, but it'll stop, Clint. Here, I'll go taser if you want. Tell them to get the uh, shit. Stop, stop. Back that up so stop stop no um it's possibly that the sidewalk was wet could have been ice I know it's cold out uh but man he took a hell of a fall but he recovered from it pretty well It, if you've never fallen on the ground before, especially on like concrete, it fucking hurts. Stop now! So, listen to the sound of the taser. So at that point, it's pretty loud, right? A loud taser is indicative that you do not have a good connection. Also, the person continuing to be able to move around is indicative that you don't have a good connection. Yeah, no. Stop! No! That second cartridge that he fired, you start to hear the sound of the taser change. No! I still think that there was some uh, 
clothing disconnect issues, but I think that there was probably a couple times as the clothing material was moving around that it was making intermittent connections because you could hear the taser go so that tells me that it was getting intermittent connections here and there so the probe was probably stuck in the clothing and as he was slipping and sliding on this uh sidewalk area um the probe would get close enough to the skin to be able to make contact arc through whatever and he would start feeling the effects of nmi but as he shifted boom that clothing would cause that probe to move away and he would have no connection at that point stop dude stop literally drop it man ineffective so he quickly recognized the fact that the taser was ineffective and went ahead and put it away the guy's up he's moving he's already fired both cartridges this taser is now just a paperweight <laughs> So why did they fire, or why did one of them end up firing at this guy? Um, let's back it up. For one, he was turned around in a combative stance facing the officers. And so um, the officer may have feared for his life and or the life of the other officers. And thought that an attack was imminent and this guy was going to charge at him. Or he could have felt that once this guy entered through these doors into this populated building that's going to have numerous people, that those people could then be at risk of being seriously injured and or killed by this guy. So he could be acting in the protection of those people who are in there. And a third uh, plausible reason, or at least a, a third um, defense to his force, is this guy has charged at officers with an edged weapon, a deadly weapon. And he is trying to flee from those officers. So he could be uh, justified in using, using deadly physical force to stop a person a fleeing felling who is a substantial risk to the public. Tennessee versus Gardner. Don't move! Your hands. Stop! Don't move! Hey, get inside! Hold your stomach! Hold your stomach! So you can see that the guy has not been um, fully 100% incapacitated. He does appear to be immobilized at this point. He is on the ground, but just because he's on the ground does not mean that he is not a deadly physical threat. Um, he's still moving. He's obviously still breathing. He is able to prop himself up. He's not laying completely flat on the ground. At this point, um, we don't know what effect these rounds have had. We know that he's dropped to the ground, but we don't know if he's going to stay on that ground and be completely physically and mentally out of the fight. So at this moment, it could be um, an appropriate thing for one of those officers over there to get close enough to spray him in the face with pepper spray. That way, if he does try to get back up again and grab that knife, he's going to be limited in his ability to see very well because the OC is going to cause involuntary eye closure and also the capsinam um will get into uh, the lungs and, and cause a sensation of difficulty breathing. They'll start coughing a whole lot, um, start producing a lot of mucus. It's just going to make things a lot more difficult for them. Um, and it may further aid into mentally incapacitating them because of all the pain that they are now feeling from the pepper spray. Go to your stomach. Roll on your stomach, Go to your stomach, man. Roll over. Roll over. Watch your cross. Here, go down, go down. Hands. Yeah, there's some down there. You good? Yeah, I'm good. Who's on So I'm not the biggest fan of using a knife to cut 
clothing items off of a person because you could accidentally incur an injury on that person. Um, knives that have a seatbelt cutter type of application built into them I think would be the best type of knife, utility knife to keep on you. That way you can just put that hook into that object and uh, cut through it. Or having a dedicated uh, cutting hook on you. That's going to be the safest thing to use. Or if you've got shears on you, that would be good to use. But um, I think for a quick, easy thing, one of those knives that has a seatbelt cutter or just a rescue hook or a hook cutting device that's on you would be the most optimal thing to be able to use. Judging off this guy's clothing and the appearance of his his dirty hands and his, his, his feet not having uh, or not appearing to have any shoes on them, he appears to be barefoot, or at least maybe wearing some socks, maybe. Hands. It's possible that this is a transient kind of person, and that um, this whole episode that he's gone through is because he is highly intoxicated, uh, or is uh, under the influence of some type of drug, and he's just not acting right. And also coupled with the good possibility that he has some mental health issues. He may not just be all right there in the head. Unfortunately, um, the transient population does seem to suffer from that quite a bit. But at the end of the day, there's still nothing that's going to change as far as those tactics go that these officers used. Just because someone's crazy... It doesn't mean that they are now exempt from having um, these levels of force being used against them. The officers still need to be able to go home at the end of the day. They need to be able to go home with the same amount of holes in them that they came to work with and the same amount of blood in their body that they came to work with. Um, there doesn't need to be any changes in that. They need to, be able to go home and be safe. The public needs to be safe. So... It's, it's sad, it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. I do like how I'm seeing everyone wearing gloves. So it seems like to me that when they got out and they were going to be dealing with this guy, they knew... That there was a very high probability that it was going to go hands-on. And so they all seem to have gotten prepared for that and have put gloves on. That's good. When you know you're going hands-on someone, especially someone who's transient and you know they're going to be dirty, um, put gloves on. Protect yourself. Don't catch any diseases from these people. For, uh, yeah, I said for Yeah. Uh, you felt me in the Put your head up, bud. Uh, lower region. What's your name, man? Yeah, he's got one on the leg. Looks like. Right okay, What's just... your name? Mm -hmm. What's your name, man? Mm -hmm. Holy cold, cold. It's pretty hard, buddy. Hey, come here! Drop what you have, dude. Okay, just talk to us, dude. On the ground! Yeah, on the ground! Yeah. On the ground, dude! Yeah. Stay there! Don't move! Don't move! Hey, there's people! We got... Hey, stop! That's fire! Stop! Don't move! So you hear him call out, Hey, there's people. So he is thinking about... The possibility that this guy could go in there and maybe take a hostage, hurt someone, kill someone, etc. Go move! Go move! Stop! Go move! Hey, get inside! Hey, hold on, hold on, hold on. Slow down, slow down. Roll out into your stomach, sir. Hold on, hold on. Crossfire, watch crossfire. 
Officers placed the suspect in handcuffs, rendered medical aid, and called for an ambulance. The suspect was subsequently transported to a local area hospital and was treated for his injuries. No one else was injured during this incident. Further investigation confirmed that the suspect was carrying a fixed blade knife in a sheath. The Sparks Police Department is the investigating agency for this incident and the officer involved was placed on administrative leave during this ongoing investigation. The Sparks Police Department identified the suspect as Marcus Lee Lewis. Lewis was charged with resisting a public officer with a deadly weapon and walking upon the highway. In the coming months, the Reno Police Department's Office of Internal Affairs will review all relevant information from this case and will make a determination as to whether the officer's tactics, drawing and use of a deadly weapon, and use of force were within the policy and standardized procedures of the Reno Police Department. Those findings will be submitted to the Chief of Police for review in accordance with Reno Police Department policy. This body worn camera footage has been made available as a summary of events. All right. So, um, walking upon the highway. If this guy was just not walking in the middle of the road, chances are police never would have come into contact with him. Uh, none of this would have ever happened. Possible. Not guaranteed. All right, that's it. If you like what you hear and see, go ahead and give me a like and a share. If you have not already, hit the subscribe button and stay tuned for more Monday quarterback videos. Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense, thank you for watching.